So before I actually get into the clay of my second ocarina, uh, or my second stone whistle, um, I want to do a couple of extra kind of steps. Our first ocarina was um, sort of an attempt to really just get this uh, voicing and the airway correct so that we could have a, a stone whistle that sang. Uh, but for the second ocarina, I want you to pay a little bit more attention to the, you know, to the overall design of it. Uh, the way that I approached this one was, you know, a stone whistle that would sit down on the table and, and has like four legs. It's got a little bit of like a, sort of an animated character look to them. This one also has some tuning holes cut in the side. So uh, I want to kind of open up some possibilities for you guys here. Uh, the easiest way to kind of begin a project um, where, uh, you know, you're going to be making some creative decisions would be just to put some pencil to paper. Uh, but what I want you to kind of work on, and I've already got a few examples here, are some sketched out ideas of, of sort of how you want the inside and the outside of your um, ocarina to be. And you're making a couple of um, both uh, sort of aesthetic and pragmatic uh, um, decisions along the way. The pragmatics would be, you know, where's the airway coming in? Where's the window going to be cut? Where might I put tuning holes? Uh, those are just, you know, uh, like if I'm going to get this thing to sing, those are really pragmatic sort of pieces that fit in. Uh, what is the size and shape of the resonance chamber? The resonance chamber is the sort of belly of the whistle here, and I sort of like a mouthpiece that uh, comes out the top. Uh, I know that my window has to be cut sort of vertically in from the top here. Uh, I know that the wedge or the blade comes in here. Uh, but then I've got some more stylistic decisions about, you know, what might it look like? Um, what might the mouthpiece look like? How might I make decisions about, you know, what shape uh, the sort of front of the mouthpiece is where you bring it up to your lips? Uh, how might you hold it in your hands? And as soon as, uh, as, soon as you start Start making those decisions they're really uh, you know there's just not really any right answer here it's a little bit just more about uh, sort of how you want the aesthetics of this structure to be um, so uh, at, at least make a few sketches here uh, sketches that just sort of describe how this thing is going to live in the world and uh, it's going to end up making your work as a, a you know sculptor much easier if you've quickly rendered it out on paper first a um, couple things to remember is uh, as you're working on this airway uh, and, and the voicing, uh, consider a couple of very particular um, sort of pragmatics. Uh, the airway has got to come in to the piece, and essentially your breath uh, was, needs to be split uh, as it comes into the piece. It hits this blade here, and the blade is sort of at about a 45 degree angle or so, and some of your breath is forced up and out of the whistle, and some of your breath is forced down into the whistle, and that breath that's forced down gets trapped and, and sort of starts to spiral inside of our resonance chamber. So, you know, it, it, it's an interesting sort of thing to consider, like what, what shape should I make this resonance chamber in order to change the sound, the pitch, the feel of the whistle, um, the location and size of that opening, how long the airway is, if it's a really long airway, a really short airway. Those aren't just kind of like what you might want it to look like, but um, you know how you might want it to feel and sound. So your voicing, where you kind of cut down in and the blade, should probably be toward the edge of your ocarina so that you've got a, a fairly sort of steady drop here uh, and then the resonance chamber is sort of large enough to contain a little bit of your breath. Uh, but just about all of your other decisions, um, stylistic decisions, right, have to do with, um, you know, what you want this thing to look like. Uh, I really sort of enjoy the the texturing tool I designed in a previous project, uh, and so I'll be using that on this piece again, uh, but I would like to introduce some more smooth areas. Uh, on my first ocarina, I covered the whole thing in texture. Um, this one, I think I'm going to leave some of the uh, ocarina smooth. Work out some sketches. I've done, you know, four, five, six different sketches here, some that deal with uh, airway, some that deal with design, um, but I also want to talk a little bit today about um, some of those more specialized tools. Uh, the ones that uh, you absolutely have to have are your fipple sticks and and the, the smoother these are um, the probably better chance you are of having a nice clean airway that comes in making sure that you've got uh, a couple of different sizes so that you know you can shape the blade and the voicing simultaneously as they come in but they're not the only tools that I find that I um, that I end up using uh, either a wooden blade or a metal blade I found really really handy uh, the wooden blades sort of do some of the larger wet clay work uh, once the clay starts to dry out uh, one of these metal blades does a great job these aren't in your kit um, but you you know you might feel to find something like this at home uh, anything that's got a nice sharp edge on it will help really sculpt and sharpen up 
um, some of those uh, voicing areas. Now, the other thing that I uh, reach for is a, a pick tool or a needle tool. This would be for like if I'm trying to get little tiny bits of clay out that, you know, I'm sculpting and there's just, you know, a little wad of something in there. Uh, a needle tool can reach in and grab that out. We don't have one of these in our art kit. Um, and so uh, this one uh, was purchased from like a ceramic supply store and it has a thicker needle on one end and a thinner needle on the other. Um, but what, uh, what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm just gonna make an even thinner needle. I'm gonna use a pin, uh, like for, you know, sewing pin, and I'll give it a little bit more sturdy handle. Uh, this handle is a piece of bamboo. It's actually probably a leftover chopstick or something. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, this bit of bamboo to make a handle for the needle tool uh, so that I have an even thinner needle for reaching inside of the ocarina and getting those tiny little bits of clay out. Now the other thing that I'll be using uh, during this tutorial is uh, a reamer. And this reamer has two ends again, uh, one that's very tapered, gently tapered, and one that's very abruptly tapered. Um, now the reamer you won't have any use for likely unless you want to try to add uh, tuning hole to the outside of your ocarina. This ocarina has three holes in the outside which allows it to play a couple note scale. Um, now in order to get that tuned uh, I'll use uh, sort of a downloadable app on my smartphone to kind of make sure that I'm actually hitting the right pitches uh, but to refine that uh, those pitches I'll end up you know blowing a note and then carefully opening up the hole just very slightly or carefully kind of smoothing down that hole and the kind of larger uh, or smaller the diameter of those tuning holes, the you know the flatter or sharper your pitches will be. Uh, if you wanted to buy one, go for it, but um, they're not the most complicated tools in the world to make. You just need a few specialized tools and a bit of patience. So let's start with this um, piece of bamboo. Uh, <clears throat> in order to get a needle to stick into the end of this bamboo, I could probably just you know do something very crude like tape it in, but this is a tool I'll probably use a whole bunch. And so what I did was I carefully cut a kerf into the end and in order to do that I have a very very thin kerfed saw and very very carefully so that I didn't cut my fingers uh, raked the teeth of that saw at a bit of an angle so that um, the saw actually cuts a kerf down into the end of this very very thin piece of bamboo. Now, even though that kerf is at a bit of an angle, um, I'm only going to end up using maybe the first quarter of an inch or so of that, and if I need to bend this a bit, I will. So I'm not going to worry about saving this little yellow ball that comes off the end. Just fire that thing off. I'll save the sharp end uh, for, for doing the working end of the tool, and I'll lay this other end in, and it's already a fairly snug fit, but I'm still going to use a bit of glue in order to make that perfectly fit. The glue I like to use in my ceramic studio uh, for all kinds of repairs and fixes are these um, two-part epoxies. Uh, it takes a little bit more time and effort to mix those up, uh, but um, I find that I never have to go back and fix the stuff. Uh, it stays put pretty well. What you end up doing is you squeeze out about half, uh, half hardener, half resin, mix that up, and then it gives me about five minutes or so of working time before I'm done. So before, you know, before I actually glue this thing up, what I might do, since I'm going to be using this tool quite a bit, is I'll, you know, rough off any of those edges and um, any any tool that I, uh, I'm using with my hands a lot. I want it to feel good in my hands, so. Uh, just kind of knock off any rough edges. Okay, so now I'm going to fill that little channel uh, with a bit of glue and lay the needle in there. Now this epoxy is uh, pretty strong stuff. I don't love to get it on my fingers because it just does not come off very easily. It's kind of a oily stuff. The, the uh, solvent you need to use in order to get it off of surfaces is pretty nasty stuff. So. Um, I'm going to do my best not to get any on my fingers. If I need to wipe it, I'll just use a scrap piece of paper and wipe off the edges and fit the needle down inside of there. I want to make sure that um, there's epoxy sort of around all the edges, and I want to make sure that my needle is sort of sticking out proud enough. And I'll give maybe just the whole outside of this tool a light coat of that epoxy since I mixed up a little extra. The epoxy has the... Uh, double benefit of actually waterproofing this little bit of bamboo too. It sort of treats it like a finish. All right, to avoid getting that all over my fingers, I'll just wipe it with a piece of paper, scrap paper. Okay, so that would probably be fine just by itself. Uh, that's going to hold. Just because I'm going to end up walking away from this thing for a while, uh, I'm going to uh, stick a clamp on there just to really squeeze that all together. Now 
Alrighty. Uh, five, ten minutes later, that'll be a working tool ready to go. So I'll come back to that. Now, the next tool that I'm going to do a little bit of working with um, would be that reamer. Uh, so that one takes a little bit more time, a little bit more energy to, uh, to produce. Uh, and you wouldn't really need it unless you plan on doing some tuning. Uh, so let's find a piece of scrap uh, dowel. Uh, I have a little bit of oak here. Uh, an oak dowel is going to be a little bit harder. This dowel uh, was like a really, really um, light wood, probably a basswood or, um, or a linden. Uh, the oak is going to be a little bit tougher to, uh, to sand down, um, but, uh, but will probably end up lasting me quite a bit longer. The big idea here is I need to somehow remove uh, wood from all the way around this dowel, almost sharpening it like I would sharpen a pencil. Now, if I happen to have a gigantic pencil sharpener, uh, that would be perfect, but I don't. Uh, so instead, what I think I'll do is I'll chuck one end of it into a drill and bring it to my sander and uh, sand down those edges. So that's not going anywhere. Now I'll run the drill along the edge of a belt sander and that'll carefully remove it down, just like as if I was sharpening a pencil. This belt sander is just like the one we run at school, and just like at school, absolutely necessary to run safety glasses and hearing protection. I made this little sanding block to hold my piece so that I never have to get my fingers too close to that 80 grit sandpaper. With this thing sort of rough down, uh, now my only job would be to um, sort of sand down any of the uh, inconsistencies or um, polish it down. Just like the Fipple sticks, uh, it's going to work the best if it's really nice and smooth. The whole point would be for it to sort of polish down the edges. And so um, the sandpaper that's in your kit uh, is sort of a really nice kind of um, uh, roughing sandpaper, like a 120 or a 220 grit. Uh, but if you're going to really get a nice smooth polish on your, on your pieces, you'll probably need something something like uh, 300, 400 grit. Uh, this one has a little bit of um, sort of a rougher finish. It kind of lives in the probably um, 300 grit sandpaper. And this one is a little bit finer tooth on it. It lives in the 400 to 600 grit sandpaper. Uh, and that's just going to polish down the outside of the wood uh, and give it um, just a really, really nice smooth finish. So the last thing I might do, uh, since this tool is going to be, you know, in and out of clay and in a toolbox and stuff like that, I'll probably use it with um, with water occasionally. Is uh, I might consider sealing the outside, and um, for that purpose, I don't I don't need any fancy stain or anything like that. I might just use some oil. Um, happen to have some tongue oil here in the shop, so put just a bit in my hand and uh, work the tool through that. The tongue oil. Uh, just like a mineral oil or a beeswax, anything like that, just kind of closes up the surface of the wood uh, so that it doesn't absorb too much water. Uh, as far as um, handmade's tool goes, it also makes uh, a much nicer looking tool. Shows off all that wood grain. Uh, so there you go, another tool in the kit. Looks good. <laughs>